We have a very special guest who comes highly recommended from uh, several of my friends and colleagues. And he's originally from Australia. But he's been living up in Manchester recently, but he spent five years living in the south of France. And he spent 20 years researching the stunning alignments around the area of Languedoc and Rennes-le-Chateau and other parts of southern France. And he's come up with this remarkable book called The Map and the Monument. And this is first time at megalithomania and we're delighted he's come here because it really fits in with the work of people like John Michel who's you know obviously one of our heroes and so I'd like to give a warm megalithomania welcome to Simon Miles. Good well thank you very much uh, Hugh. It's an absolute pleasure and delight to be here and very glad to have been invited by Hugh so Thank you very much. So yes, I've been working on a project for over 20 years. As you can tell, I'm from Australia, but I've been working on a project uh, about the landscape geography in the south of France. And uh, let's begin by getting our bearings. This is the area here. So this is the Pyrenees, France and Spain. And it's this area around here. It's an absolutely fascinating area of culture and history. It's been occupied by humans for tens of thousands of years. There's caves at a place called Niao that have superb cave art showing where humans were here at least 20,000 years ago. There were Celtic tribes here in the megalithic times, then the Romans invaded, then the Visigoths invaded. And in the 11th and the 12th centuries, the Templars were very active in this area. And the Templars built many fascinating chateaus, fortresses, on extraordinary locations, peaks, ridges, high places. There's something like 50 of these chateaus throughout this area and this afternoon I'm going to be talking uh, about those chateaus. But I'm going to start by talking about the three largest mountains at this eastern end of, of the Pyrenees. <clears throat> so the three mountains are the Peak de Canigou down here, this is very sacred to the Catalan people, the Peak de Madres, and the Peak de Saint Barthélemy. These are essentially the three large massifs that make up the eastern end of the Pyrenees. Now there's something very fascinating to start off with, with the relationship between the two highest mountains, Madres and Canigou. If you draw a straight line between them, it's at an angle of 124 degrees bearing to north. That happens to be the angle of the winter solstice sunrise at this latitude. So to begin, the two mountains that, that form the eastern end of the Pyrenees happen to fall into this relationship already. Now, were the ancients aware of that? Well, in fact, we can be certain that they were because to this day, there is a ceremony held on the summer solstice where the Catalan people climb to the summit of Canigou and perform certain rituals up there. Now, of course, on that day, the sun will set along that line behind Madres. So right off the bat, we have an example here of a natural alignment in the landscape to the winter solstice sunrise, which was recognised and preserved in ritual by the people that live there. There's something else about the, the, the mountain Canigou. It's actually named after the star Sirius. The canny part comes from Canis Major. So here we have the largest holy mountain at the end of the Pyrenees on a solstice alignment named after the star Sirius. Now I wonder why that would be. Peak de Saint Barthélemy is also a very highly regarded mountain by the, the local people, a, a holy mountain. And there's a ritual that takes place on that mountain also to do with the sun. It doesn't take place anymore, but for centuries, if not millennia, on the evening of August the 23rd each year, the villagers would climb to the top of the mountain to watch the sun rise on August the 24th. Now, August the 24th happens to be the feast day of Saint Barthélemy, which goes some way to explaining why this happens, except that the ritual predates the naming of the mountain as St. Barthélemy. So there is some deeper reason why the villagers would climb to the top of the mountain to watch the sunrise on that particular day. So let's keep that in mind as we progress. There's an image from the peak of Madras looking along that solstice line at the peak of Canigou, showing you that it's, it's not just two random mountains that have been... Uh, chosen here, but there's a very clear, dramatic uh, effect in the landscape. All right, so here's, here's the alignment we've just spoken of here. Here are two of the most prominent Templar chateaux in the area. One at a place called Keribus, 
and the other Peopetus. These are both very spectacular, set high on ridges. And if you draw a straight line between them, it is also on the same angle of 124 degrees. So these chateaux are related to each other by the solstice line. Not only that, if you can continue this line down, it passes very precisely through the cathedral in Perpignan. Now, Perpignan, of course, is the main city in this area, and that's the only cathedral in this entire area. So we have this alignment to the solstice through two chateaus and a cathedral, which is echoing or mirroring, if you like, the, uh, the alignment between the mountains. This is uh, Chateau Caribus from a really spectacular video uh, from Drone Ock on YouTube, taken from a drone. So this is the chateau itself. This is the mountain of Madres. So this is looking south. This is Canigou. So you can see here that Caribus looks across at these two mountains quite clearly across this plain. You can already see that things are communicating with each other. Now, Caribus is a very fascinating chateau. It has a shape with, I think, 13 facets, and it's a very unusual uh, shape. There's no apparent regularity to it, but there is a regularity, and the regularity is provided by the sun. Now, as the sun rises over here and goes through the sky, it successively lights up the different walls, and as you can see, this one's in shadow. So as the sun progresses, the walls fall into shadow, essentially forming a solar clock. So once you know this and you're in the region, at a glance, you can literally see what time it is. And it's not just accidental. It's all being timed and it literally counts out hours as it gets to the other side of the chateau. So the outside of, of, of Caribus is a solar clock. But then so too is the inside. And this is a plan of the Grand Salle, which is the, the main chamber inside Caribou Chateau. There's a couple of things to notice. First of all, it's offset. It's not aligned at north-south. It consists of four rectangular chambers of different sizes with crossed arches and in the centre a very spectacular pillar, known as a sun pillar in this case. Now, the geometry of this room has been very carefully organised so that a line from the centre here grazing the pillar is exactly north-south. A line from this point here grazing the pillar is exactly east-west. And a line standing underneath the crossed arches here, this ray grazing the pillar is exactly pointing to the winter solstice sunrise. This line equivalently points to the solstice sunrise in summer. The other lines mark the transition of the sun into the different zodiac signs. Now, this is very remarkable because there's no windows on this side. These alignments don't actually exist with light towards the sun. They are geometrically reproduced within the building. So what we have at this chateau is solar architecture within, on the outside, and then in its relationship in the wider landscape to these other places around. Now, my wife and I, my wife Judith is in the audience, we had the great pleasure of being at Caribous on the summer solstice in 2012, and we wanted to watch the sun set behind Pea Petus. Unfortunately, the clouds came in, and this is a painting my wife did, a sketch. There's Pea Petus, the fortress on this ridge, and there's this rather remarkable notch here. The sun on the summer solstice descends and literally falls into that notch like a basketball into a hoop. But unfortunately, we didn't get to see it. Now, even this is just to scratch the surface of what's going on with this geometry. If we start at Madras here and we draw a line through Chateau Caribus, it turns out that this is a very exact 60-degree bearing. Very exact. If we continue it on, it intersects another of these spectacular Templar chateaus at a place called Agia, which means eagle. So we have a line here between the mountain and the two Chateaus here exactly on a 60 degree alignment. If we connect Canagou to Perpignan Cathedral, it's also a 60 degree alignment. So we see something emerging here, a parallelogram, those two sides parallel to the solstice, those two sides parallel to 60 degrees, and everything's starting to merge together, the mountains and the chateaus and now these solstice al alignments. Okay, well that's the region. now. <clears throat> I began looking at this way back in the mid-90s, and I was living in Australia at the time, and the beginning of my journey was Henry Lincoln's book, The Holy Place, which I'm sure there are many people here today who will be familiar with this book. 
Henry Lincoln, of course, who sadly passed away last year, uh, he was the person who popularised the Renle Chateau mystery in the Western world. He produced a series of documentaries for the BBC in the 70s on this, and then famous books Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and various others. Then he produced this book, The Holy Place. Now, in this book, he introduced an entirely different element to this so-called Renle Chateau affair. He claimed to have discovered a whole series of alignments in the landscape, a lot of them. And when I came across this book in the 90s, I was fascinated by this, and by then I'd been brought up on a steady diet of John Michel and Graham Hancock and all these kinds of books, so I wasn't very interested in the treasure story of Renle Chateau. I was very interested in these alignments. It seemed to me that there was a very remarkable situation going on here. But who was going to check it? So I put my hand up, and I rode away to Paris, and I got the map, and I started this project. I didn't think it would occupy me for more than a couple of months. I was just going to go through Henry's book and check. Well, here I am 30 years later, still obsessed with this thing. To add a long story short, what I found with the holy place was that many of the alignments that Henry identified were amazing and absolutely accurate and present. Not so successful were his attempts to create shapes. There's a pentagon of mountains, he claims, various measures. Those parts of the book didn't work as well for me, but the alignments were very interesting. And I want to just bring up one of these alignments to show you. This one is about seven miles long. This is at an angle. This is uh, a church here in a small village, St. Juste de la a Templar commandery here at a place called La Val Dieu, the, the Valley of God. The church in this village of Ren le Ban, we'll talk about that more. Another chateau here, and a chateau, a very special chateau, the Chateau of Arc up here. So five sites, all dating to the 11th, 12th century, on a perfect alignment. But I noticed something that Henry Lincoln and the other author who discovered this, David Wood, hadn't remarked upon, and that is that this line is at an exact 45 degrees in the landscape. And that seems to me very significant. Five sites on an alignment is already pretty impressive. But for that alignment to be at 45 degrees started to seem to me like that there might be intentionality here. Now, this is the Arc Chateau at the northeast corner of that line. It's very remarkable building. It's not on a high point like the other chateaus. It's in an expansive flat ground, and it's a square tower oriented to the cardinal directions north, south, east, west. OK, so the 45-degree line, as you can see, the next slide is going to show you a plan of this, hopefully. And you will see that the, square, this is, the chateau is in a square cross-section and has diagonals actually running across the roof line. The 45-degree line actually passes through the <laughs> diagonal of the roof. You know, just remember what you saw there. Now, the other thing is it passes through the corner of the compound because it's quite dramatic. The, the chateau is not in the centre of this rectangular compound, but it's offset so that the 45-degree line only passes through one of the four corners. OK, so there are two villages called Ren in the area. One is Ren le Chateau. It's now famous. The priest got rich. Nobody knows where his money came from. It sits high on a hill. Thousands of books have been written, the Da Vinci Code. Its twin village is Ren le Ban, a couple of kilometres to the east. And it has a different profile. It's hidden away in a river valley. It also has some very deep mysteries around it, but it hasn't had nearly the same profile as its uh, more famous cousin. Now, Ren le Ban is a fascinating village. It goes back to pre-Roman times. It has thermal springs there, which to this day bring tourists to enjoy uh, the balmy healing waters. And this is from a book, The History of Ren Le Ban, which describes the axes of the village of Ren Le Ban as it was laid out by the Romans. Now, as, as I'm sure you're aware, most Roman towns are laid out on a pair of axes, the Cardo, which runs north-south, and the Decumanus, which runs east-west. But this system is flexible. In the case of Ren Laban, it occupies a very narrow strip of land next to the river, which happens to run at an angle of 15 degrees. So the Cardo and Decumanus axes here are at an angle of 15 degrees to the normal north-south. If you continue the Cardo axis of the village to the north, it finishes on the summit of this very interesting mountain here called Pesh Kardu. Now, this word Kardu comes from the word Cardo. In other words, this Cardo of the village has left its mark in the name of the mountain, Cardu. All right, well, one day I marked on my map the two axes of the village and I also marked in the 45 degree line. And staring at this, it suddenly occurred to me that if that's a 15 degree angle and that's a 45 degree angle, that must be a 30 degree segment between the two uh, lines through Ren Laban. 
Now, at that point, I was rather obsessed with a book called Sacred Geography of the Ancient Greeks by Jean Rocher, translated in English by our very good friend Christine Roan, who's sitting down in the front. And when this idea occurred to me, I was obsessed with the idea of landscape zodiacs, with the idea of a central point, being the, the landscape being divided into 12 segments. And I suddenly thought, well, is it possible that there's one of these landscape zodiacs clustered around Ren Le Bum? Well, I soon filled in the, the other lines and discovered that in, indeed there is a zodiac. Some of the lines are extraordinary. This one passes through another Templar chateau, Blanche Fort, which means White Fort, over the Black Rock to Ren Le Barn. The others finish on, on peaks here. And there's a meridian through Ren Le Barn. We'll talk about that in a minute, which passes. I looked at that and realised, well, well, look, perhaps there really is a zodiac in the landscape. But I pretty soon realised that I was by no means the first to have possibly thought of this. And, and to explain why I had this idea, I, I need to introduce two texts from the so-called Renle Chateau affair. Here's a map of, of, of one of the landscape zodiacs that Professor Richet found in, in Greece around Delphi. As you can see, the landscape is divided into 12 sections allocated to signs of the zodiac. And what Richet found was that typically towns in a particular segment would have coins, for example, which would have the zodiac sign of that segment on the coins, or temple decorations, vases. He found that in his, in his understanding, almost the entirety of Greek culture referenced back to these landscape zodiacs. One example I like, the island of Hydra here is in the Leo segment. Well, Hydra is a constellation in the sky in the Leo segment. So here we have an example of a place name actually deriving from a constellation in the appropriate section. Right, the first book I want to talk about very briefly was written by the priest of Ren Le Barn in 1886. It was called La Vraie Longue Celtique et le Cromlec de Ren Le Barn. By the priest, his name was Henri, Henri Boudet. Now, this is a very strange book uh, for many reasons. It's puzzled people for 100 years. In it, he talks about the existence of a cromlech or a stone circle around Ren Le Barn, which he describes as being 16 or 18 kilometres in circumference. So clearly this is not a normal stone circle. And in fact, there really is nothing in the landscape that corresponds to this format that he talks about. So people have wondered for literally 100 years what he was talking about with this cromlech of Ren Le Barn. Now, in one chapter of this book, he takes you on a tour of the Cromlech, a walking tour around Ren Le Barn, and he points out various landmarks. The second text I want to bring up is a very strange poem. It appeared in Paris in 1967. It's called Le Serpent Rouge, The Red Serpent. It's a surrealist poem made up of stanzas where each stanza is associated with a sign of the zodiac. Now, the poem is very difficult to understand and mysterious, but... People have agreed that it identifies several landmarks around the town of Ren Le Barn and seems to, have, seems to describe a walk, again, around the village of Ren Le Barn. Well, it occurred to me, but, but the thing about this walk is it's calibrated by its progress around the zodiac with the stanzas. So as this unnamed protagonist walks through the landscape, he passes from zodiac sign to zodiac sign. Again, no one's ever been able to work out what's going on. Well, it occurred to me that perhaps the poem was an illustration of the walk in Boudet's book. So what I did was I worked out what the, the plan of the walk in Boudet's book was, and I, and I mapped it on Google Earth, and then I worked out what the walk was in Le Serpent Rouge, and I mapped that on Google Earth, and it turns out they are indeed the same walk. Then I mapped them onto my zodiac, and I had to allocate some signs, and I, I put Aquarius up the top here, and then around they go, Leo at the bottom, Interestingly enough, this layout mirrors the Glastonbury Zodiac found by uh, Mrs. Maltwood, in which Aquarius is also at the top and Leo, and Leo at the bottom. So I just add that in. But it, when I check the poem, it turns out that this is indeed the solution. For example, in the, in the Pisces section, the poem talks about standing on the white rock, looking over the black rock towards here. It also talks about trying to find the way to this sacred spring, the source of the Madeleine, which is in the Leo segment of the poem. And there's other uh, confirmations in there, and this is all in my book. All right, well, I thought, well, that's very interesting. Well, who was it then in 1967 who had the idea of this zodiac and wrote this poem? 
I thought about this and I realised, I came to realise that first of all the Renault Chateau mystery was launched in 1967 with a book called The Gold of Wren by a guy called Gerard de Sede. Jean Rocher's book, The Sacred Geography of the Ancient Greeks, the original French version, also was released in 1967 in Paris. And Le Serpent Rouge, the poem, was also released in Paris in 1967. It seemed to me an incredible coincidence that these three texts all seemingly connected, had all emerged in Paris in the same year. I began to wonder whether Professor Richet himself might have had some involvement. Well, to cut a long story short, again, and the long story is in my book, but I have come to the conclusion that Professor Jean Richet, the author of these extraordinary books on landscape geometry in the Middle East and the Near East and, and throughout the Mediterranean, was in fact the author of this very strange poem, Le Serpent Rouge, which forms a part of the Renal Chateau mystery. One of the best pieces of evidence that I've found is his follow-up volume. This came out three years later, and as you can see down the bottom, it was part of a series curated by Gerard de Sede himself, the author of the Renault Chateau Mystery. So here are the two authors just three years later bringing out a book uh, together. Within this book, Jean Rocher quotes from an ancient Greek poem, the Homeric Hymn to Apollo. He talks about the battle of Apollo and the serpent Python for the rulership of Delphi which is the founding myth of Delphi. And he includes various language in there which also turns up in the poem, like fingerprints of, of his style. So what Boucher was saying is that there is a connection between Delphi and ren le -Ban. That's the, 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 the idea behind his poem. And the connection relates to the fact that both of them are laid out on landscape zodiacs. Now, Rocher only came to this work with landscape zodiacs late in his career. He was visiting Greece and he had a series of prophetic dreams which introduced the landscape alignments to him. But his main career was an authority on the French poet Gerard de Naval, who lived in the first half of the 19th century. He's little known in the English world, but his reputation in, in French literature is immense. His most famous work was a short story called Sylvie, this is a diagram that Jean Rocher published in 1966, analysing Nerval's short story, Sylvie, and showing that the action of the, of the short story is organised according to a zodiac. And each chapter is associated with a different sign of the zodiac, and he analyses the story and shows that the action of each chapter corresponds symbolically to the zodiac sign that it goes through. So this is precisely the literary architecture of Le Serpent Rouge. And again, another piece of evidence that Jean Rocher himself was involved in this Renault Chateau affair in the production of this poem. Now, zodiacs in France and the south of France are, are, are by no means unknown. Here is a zodiac from a book in 1975 by a guy called Guy René de Miro, centred on Toulouse. And as you, here's, here's Leo, for example. Well, well, here's the Gulf of Lyon, and the town of Lyon is in here. So there's various... Aquitaine is an Aquarius. So there's various interesting correlations between the zodiac and the country of France, according to Guy René de Miro. And there's another image from his book. In this case, he's replaced the zodiac with the coat of arms of Occitania, which is this cross you see here. The cross has these 12 little circles on the edge of them, and he's been bold enough to associate those 12 with the signs of the zodiac and then position the cross on Toulouse. Now, in fact, this isn't just a fanciful, imaginative idea. If you go to Toulouse today, the centre of Toulouse, and, and by the way, Toulouse is a very ancient, very special city, at least 2,000 years old, the founding myths of Toulouse are associated with Delphi. There's another, another association. But if you go to Toulouse today, in the centre of Toulouse is a large square called the Capitol. And in the centre of the Capitol is a sculpture that's been inlaid in the pavement in brass in the late 90s, and it essentially consists of exactly this design, an Occitania cross with the zodiac laid out in the pavement in brass. So that is at the centre of the Capitol, at the centre of Toulouse, at the centre of the southern, south of France, there literally is a zodiac uh, embedded in the ground. Well, I worked on this uh, for 10 years in Australia and then eventually in 2006 I had the opportunity to visit this area for the first time and it was a revelation, it changed my life. I started going there frequently, I met Judith, we fell in love, we got married and we lived in the village of Far. and this was the tower on the top of the hill next to the village which I would climb every morning uh, to watch the sunrise and back down in time for the van from the boulangerie to arrive at our front door with fresh baguettes and croissants. So I tell you, it was 
pretty tough life. This was the view that would greet me each morning. This is Peshkadu here. This is the famous Bugarash here. And this is the sort of superb landscape. This is Renla Chateau uh, on the village on here. Renla Barn is, is, is a little bit further along there. Well, one morning I was at the, uh, was at the tower and I, I noticed that I could see the tower of the 9th century church at Esperanza. This is a mile or two away down the valley. That surprised me because this is very hilly and it was very surprising that there was a line of sight that managed to pick out the church. Well, when I got home, I marked it on the map and I discovered to my amazement that they were exactly due east of each other, the tower and Esperanza church. Well, then I completed the, the equilateral triangle and I found that the third point was marked by the church in the village of Campagne sur Ode here, which was the headquarters of the Knights Templar in the entire area. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that village later on. Furthermore, this line, when continued, extended to the peak of this mountain here, Mount Sec, a very prominent mountain in the middle of this little area. And I realised that I'd stumbled upon a fragment of a sighting network between these sites. Now, even to this day, it's a very challenging area to move around in with all the, the hills and the valleys and the ancient little tiny, tiny roads. So a means of transmitting information quickly and reliably around this landscape is absolutely crucial. And I realised that this is what was going on here, that it was possible to send signals between those, these locations. Now, this is another panoramic photo. This is from Chateau Bezu, which we'll talk about in a little. And again, this is the same view from a bit closer. This is Kardu, this is uh, Bugarach. But I want to show you this. I'm going to zoom in on that. This is the Chateau of Peopetus, which I showed you 10 minutes ago with the, the, the painting by, by Judith. This is from the other direction. And you can see the Chateau just happens to poke up between these two mountains. That's over 20 miles away. And yet, it so happens that these two chateaus have been arranged that they can, they can see each other. I was by no means the first I soon discovered to discover this. I, I discovered that there's a small band of researchers who have been looking into this and discovered that there is indeed a sighting network of these chateaus inter-visible inter between each other right across this region. And the Templars used this in the 12th century, 11th century, but it was based on a system that they already found in place that the Romans had been using, and the Romans themselves already found this system in place that the Celts had been using. So in mankind's long relationship with this landscape, they have found the places that interconnect but what I've discovered is that this network of alignments is not just a practical way of communicating, it also meshes seamlessly with these solstice alignments and other alignments to the stars. So when I first began looking at Henry's work, um, I made a discovery early on which convinced me that there was something very definitely interesting going on here. What I discovered was meridians marked in mountain peaks. And by that I mean several examples of strings of mountain peaks perfectly aligned, perfectly north-south. Now, <clears throat> these are very strange. Right, so here's the first meridian I found. It has four peaks. The first one is a quite modest mound. The second one is a panoramic lookout to this day. The third and the fourth are on these ridges which cross the landscape east-west, and it's the highest point in each case on these two ridges. Here's a side-on view, and you can see that the peaks actually go up in height as we head to the south. Well, what that indicates is that if we can find a vantage point further to the north, and indeed there is a perfect sighting ridge further to the north, you can stand and look south and see this meridian. Now, this is during the day, and it's difficult to see. It's in here. That's a fly, by the way. It's uh, caught on the camera. And again, it's difficult to see. I've made it clearer in a second, but this is the first peak, there's the second, there's the ridge, and there's the next ridge. So they look like that. So they're not, once you're aware of it, you can see this ripple in the landscape. If you didn't know it, you would never notice it. But they're not designed to be viewed during the day. They're designed to be viewed at night. Because what these meridians are, and you're going to see a few more in a second, are essentially observatories for observing the transit of heavenly bodies across the meridian. There's another photo of it from the, second, from the first of the, the three. There's the, the second, the third, and the fourth position there. That was the first one I found. I could hardly believe that, but then half an hour later I found the second one. It has ten mountains in a row. It starts up here at the highest point of the sighting ridge. The next peak is Peshkadu itself. 
So in this case, there's actually an, a true north-south meridian going through this mountain, which is essentially called Mount Meridian. After that, a further eight high points culminating in the largest of the Peche des Incarabatets. One of these, Col de Vent, is actually in a high point, but a V-shaped groove, and the one point in the ridge where it's possible to cross over. This road's been there for thousands of years, and it's the one point that is uh, not a peak, but a V-shaped groove, as it were. But nevertheless, here again, side on, here's the sighting peak, there's Cardo, and the next eight are all in ascending order of height. So here's again, here's a photo. This is from the south flank of Peshkar Do. The meridian runs up here. There's that final mountain in Karabatets. Again, it's a bit difficult to see. One, two, three, four. There's the V-shaped groove. Uh, that's a close-up. Again, there's Peshtes in Karabatets. So there is a meridian of these peaks running through here. There's the V-shaped group. The meridian runs exactly through that spot. And that, that line's been there for thousands of years. So, there's meridians marked in landscape. How did they get there? Well, can a man move a mountain? What? It seems impossible. But moving the mountains isn't the hardest part of this. The hardest part is knowing reliably and repeatedly which direction is south. How do you do that? Without a means of determining south, it would be impossible even if you could move these mountains or shape the landscape or whatever's going on. Well, I found the first two back in the mid-90s. Eventually, I moved there, and I discovered to my amazement there was another three meridians within those first two. The first two that I found were the outside. Within is three meridians. They go further down into the high points here, and I needed Google Earth and to actually be in the environment to actually discover that. So just take a moment to think how incredible that is. Five meridians marked in mountain peaks all clustered in this same area, and there's the 45-degree line that we talked about before. This is looking south from the, the, the sighting ridge. There are the five sighting points, and there are the five meridians tracing up into the Pyrenees. This is looking from the south to the north. And here's showing how this, this one, and this one actually comes from Chateau Bezu, which I showed you before. This runs through three more churches and three more mountains before terminating, and these are all absolutely exact, no fudging at all, on the church in this village of montfort sur bulzane right up in the high Pyrenees. An extraordinary piece of landscape, architecture, and surveying by, by any measure. Now, one day I, I noticed that there was something interesting about the spacing of the inner three meridians. So I've stripped away everything here except these meridians and the names that I've given them of, of, a, prominent, of a prominent site on each of the meridians. And I want to talk about the gap between these two and these two, the second and the third, and, and the third and the fourth. First of all, this one is exactly one and a half times this gap. That's the first thing to keep in mind. It turns out that the difference here is 28 arc seconds between those two meridians, and the distance between these two is 42 arc seconds, one and a half times. But not only that, when we measure the actual linear distance, it turns out that the distance between the first two meridians is exactly 25,000 inches. Between the second two, it's one and a half times that, 37,500. But 25,000 inches exactly. Now, if you think of meridians, north-south lines on the surface of a globe, they obviously get further apart as you go south and closer together as you go north. So this is actually the only latitude, the sole latitude, at which this distance, 28 arc seconds, corresponds to exactly 25,000 inches. So think about that. We have a whole number relationship between linear measure and angular measure that obtains only at this specific Latitude. All right, well, let's keep going. Now, <clears throat> I spoke about the book of Boudet before with his strange cromlech. In the back of this book was a very strange map, and here it is. And again, this has been a mystery for over 100 years. No one has ever figured out what's going on with this map. Now, the map itself was a copy of a map made by the French government in the uh, 18th century, the Etat Major, where they mapped the whole of France. So the engraver has copied that but he's changed the scale of the map. The first thing to notice is he didn't indicate the scale anywhere on this map. Now, you can tell what the scale is by very carefully measuring the distance and comparing it. It turns out that the scale is 1 to 25,000. But as I say, it's not marked anywhere. But neither is anything else marked on this map. There's no scale, there's no grid, there's no indication of where it is. By any normal standards, this is a cartographic failure. 
surely he knew this. Why, why was this incompetent map included in the book? Well, it turns out there's an enigma and a, and a mystery about this map. And for 100 years, it hasn't been solved. And I'm pleased to be able to say that I've cracked the puzzle, and it's in my book. You see this uh, very strange uh, heading up the top, Ren Celtic. It turns out that this word Ren is exactly two inches long and exactly half an inch high. The secret of Boudet's map is the English inch, the British inch. And perhaps this is why it hasn't been noticed in 100 years, because, uh, because of course, no one is looking for the inch in France, particularly in the 19th century when it's essentially illegal after Napoleon, who mandated the metric system, it was actually illegal to use imperial measures in France. Nevertheless, that's what's happened. And here's what happens when you make a grid from this word Wren and you spread the grid of half inches and you spread this half inch grid across the whole map. This left-hand border matches exactly and tells you that you're on the right side, the right, the right track. Furthermore, you can see all kinds of things in the map start to align with this grid, including the writing. Now, I've, I've done a close-up here. Here's the title, exactly two inches by half an inch. And then I've divided these half inches further by six into squares of one twelfth inch. And you can see here, beyond any doubt whatsoever, the writing on this map has been put there very, very carefully on this invisible 12th inch grid. All right, so here's what I did next. I took Boudet's map, now with his secret grid revealed after 100 years, and I superimposed it correctly on Google Earth at the right place and the right scale, and I turned on the three meridians that I had found here, and I discovered to my utter astonishment that the three meridians correspond precisely with no margin of error to these vertical grid lines on the Boudet map. Now, at that point, two quite unlikely theories have plugged together and mutually corroborate each other. On the one hand, I've discovered these meridians. That sounds like it can't be right. On the other hand, I've discovered this hidden grid on Boudet's map. That sounds like it can't be right. But when you put the two together, you realise that the only explanation for this is that the meridians are real and that somehow knowledge of these meridians has passed down into the knowledge of the priest in the 18th century. And that is why he's made this very mysterious book with this very mysterious map. He's encoded this knowledge. Now, if you think about it, <clears throat> this distance here is two squares of half an inch, so that's one inch. It's a 1 to 25,000 scale map, so that corresponds to 25,000 inches in the landscape as the distance between those two meridians, which indeed it is. So what's starting to emerge here is a toolkit of concepts by which to grasp and deal with these alignments. It's a toolkit that comprises measures, the inch, that comport with angular measures, arc seconds and arc minutes, and has been arranged at the correct latitude that the 25,000 scale, 1 to 25,000 scale, enables you to flip back and forwards between the plan, the map, the meridians, and the scale. All right. Well, the 45-degree line that revealed the zodiac hasn't fully given up all its secrets yet. I was staring at it one day, and it suddenly occurred to me, perhaps it's the diagonal of a square. Well, when I did that... <coughs> I filled the square and I noticed that the coordinates of the endpoints were 2 degrees 16 minutes 0 seconds east, 2 degrees 22 minutes 0 seconds east, which meant there was 6 minutes of arc between the two sides. Now, 6 minutes of arc is one tenth of a degree of longitude, a degree is 60 minutes of arc. So, if this is a real square, then perhaps it's meant to be a geodetic square of one tenth of a degree of longitude in width. Well, of course, this is, this is just an idea, a, a hypothesis, a theory. But then I set off trying, trying to see whether, it, in fact, it, it was true. Well, <clears throat> I tied down the two corners. That's the door of the church there. It's exactly 216.00. 222.00 turns out to be the exact corner of the compound. This is the, square, the, the slide I couldn't show you before. The 45-degree line passes through both the chateau and the guardhouse here, and the corner of the compound. And it's not true of any other of the 45 lines through the Arc Chateau. It doesn't pass through the corner. So it definitely seems like this 45-degree line is being privileged here. 
All right, because I then enabled tied down the two corners, I was able to compute the midline. The midline latitude is 42.916. When I filled that in, I discovered that the headquarters of the Templars, the Compagnie Sir O, lies precisely on that midline. Not only that, when I measured the distance from it to the two corners of the square, I found it's exactly 250,000 inches at an angle of 40 degrees to the midline. And it passes through yet another of these Templar chateaus. Well, I was starting to get the feeling that, that perhaps I had indeed stumbled upon something real. This is the village of Campagne sur Aude. This is the church. It has a very curious design of this circle of buildings with a road around it, almost like a bullseye. And here is, by calculation, the centre line of the square literally outside the door of the church. I'd also discovered this alignment here. One, two, three, four, five, six churches including the cathedral here at Alet le Bain, on a perfect alignment at a bearing of 150 degrees. Now, I discovered this five years before I discovered this the square, which I call the Arc Square. And it always puzzled me what this line pointed to because it missed the church of Ren le Bain there by a couple of hundred yards, which was rather frustrating. But when I discovered the Arc Square, I discovered that this line, without any deviation at all, points unerringly accurately to the centre of the square. So it seems that the Templars have laid out here a calibrated geodetic square of one-tenth of a degree of longitude and placed various sites in order to preserve the memory of this square. This is that the line that I just showed you here. This is the village of uh, Kyle Ho. And this is, I've zoomed in on that, Kyle Harvel, sorry. You see that the village has, again, this circular shape. This is the alignment, and you can see it grazes perfectly tangent to the village and actually runs, there's a road here and the line actually runs directly along the road. So again, this alignment is actually inscribed into the landscape. Well, I showed you before that the distance from Campania Sir Ode was 250,000 inches. So it occurred to me, now I'm already thinking about one to 25,000 scale maps, it occurred to me that that, that, that could be represented as, as, as 10 inches on, on a one to 25,000 scale diagram. So, so here we go. Here's a triangle, 40 degrees, 10 inches, and we've made a square. So this is a 1 to 25,000 scale map of the arc square. Now, how wide is it? Well, I looked up the circuit of the Earth at that latitude online. I discovered how far around the Earth it was at 42.916 degrees. I divided that into 360. I divided that into 10 to give me the width of the square. And it came out at 321,464 inches. Okay, great. So we're going to divide that by 25,000 to get the width of our planned square here. The answer was 12.858 inches. It meant absolutely nothing to me. So I converted it to millimetres, 326.6 millimetres. It still meant absolutely nothing to me. So I did what anyone would do. I googled it. And within about 45 seconds, I discovered to my astonishment that 326.6 millimetres is the exact length of the so-called pied du roi, the foot of the king which was the main foot used in France from the time of Charlemagne, 800 AD, all the way through to the 17th century. It is quoted as 326.6 millimetres. So here I had arrived at a diagram in which I have managed to generate the exact length of the pied de bois, 12.85 inches, using this very simple geometrical scheme here. Now, <clears throat> that's amazing enough, but if we now consider that it's a 1 to 25,000 scale map, well, then that tells us that the arc square in the landscape must have a width of 25,000 pieds de bois. But keep in mind, that can only be true at one latitude. And in fact, the square has been erected at the exact precise latitude where the midline is exactly 25,000 pieds de bois with literally no margin for, ever, for error. Now, to give you an example, if you go down to the bottom side of the square, it's something like 25,030 pieds de bois. If you go to the top of the square, it's 24,970 pieds de bois. So it's plus or minus 30 pieds de bois, but the midline has been selected exactly so that this square is 25,000 pieds de bois, as well as one-tenth of a degree of longitude. And by this point, I'm starting to realise that the only explanation is that this is intentional and that this is deliberate. 
Now, we're not quite done yet because the pied du roi turns out to be exactly equal to 15 fourteenth feet. Richard Heath, on his website, identifies that as the Belgic foot and ties it into the whole scheme of measures John Neal, Robin Heath, and everybody has been working with. So here we have the Belgic foot, 15 fourteenth feet, equal to pied du roi, the width of this square. Now in inches, that's 360 divided by 28 inches. I want you to keep that in mind for a moment. All right, so next topic, that was the arc square. There was a bit more excitement there, but it was probably exciting enough. Maybe it was too much excitement. <laughs> All right, remember at the beginning I mentioned this, the mountain peak to St. Barthelemy and this ritual that takes place on August the 24th, or used to, where the villagers would climb the summit. Now, in Henry Lincoln's book, The Holy Place, he talks about these positions in the middle here. I haven't put all the names in, so it's not too cluttered, but this is Campagne sur O, this is Rennes le Chateau, this is another chateau, this is Bougarach Church. And what Henry pointed out is that these two alignments form a, a pair of right angled axes. And I always thought that was very, very interesting because I'm always interested in grids, creating angles off grids. So the presence of what seemed to be a grid was very tantalizing to me. Now, when these guys did this, there was no Google Earth. So they didn't notice something that I noticed, which was that if you continue their line, First of all, it, it passes through yet another of these Templar chateaus up here, also another church down here, and one of our sighting points up here, we've already found from the meridians, but at this end, it terminates exactly on the summit of Peak de St. Barthelemy. Now, when I realised that, I thought, well, goodness me, is it possible that this is the line of the sunrise on August the 24th? Could this be the line that the villagers have been climbing the mountain to watch for thousands of years? And the answer is yes, it is. This is the sunrise on August the 24th and it rises along 74 degrees bearing. That is this exact line. So again, we have a situation here where some material that's come out of this modern, slightly kooky Rennes Le Chateau mystery turns out to seamlessly mesh with existing rituals, existing law, existing cultural things that are happening in the landscape. But it's not about the guy who got rich. It's about this ancient legacy of landscape, geography, and geometry. So these axes cross exactly on my field of meridians, which seemed to me very interesting. And as I said, it terminates on the highest point up here, which is the sighting point for the La Val Dieu meridian. So in the next slide, I'm going to take away everything except the two axes and that meridian. And there it is. Now, it turns out that there's a fascinating relationship between Campagne sur Aude and Gilles de Bacou. It's exactly 500,000 inches away. And it's at the exact angle that creates a 3, 4, 5 triangle with the meridian and with the midline of the square. This is 400,000 inches. This is 300,000 inches. This is 500,000 inches. We have a 3, 4, 5 triangle laid out in the landscape in units of hundred thousands of inches. Well, that can't be right, surely. That seems crazy. Except that it keeps on going. This triangle now, made out of the two axes, that is 300,000 inches, that is 400,000 inches, and it shares the same hypotenuse. So now we have two nested 3, 4, 5 triangles based around this line, the sunrise line from, from, from Bar Barthelemy. Now, if you look at this diagram, you can see that this point here is going to be equidistant from here and from here. So we can draw a circle here. And when we do that, we discover, to our amazement, that the point that crosses the circle is exactly where Bugarach Church lies on this line. So this gives us yet another three, four, five triangle. That's 300,000. That's 400,000. We have three nested, three, four, five triangles perfectly laid out in hundreds of thousands of inches. Well... <clears throat> One day I was uh, watching a video by Howard Crowhurst from Megalithomania several years ago talking about his incredible work in Karnak and in the middle of the video he brought up a slide of a Babylonian tablet showing a piece of geometry from 1700 BC. It was found in the royal archives in the palace in Susa in what is now Iran. You could be able to recognise that it's exactly the same geometry as shown in the landscape. Of course, that's not so impressive if I can't show you the actual image. <clears throat> you have to take my word for it. 
Okay, well, we'll just keep moving through. So <clears throat> let me summarise that. That geometry that I just showed you of the three, four, five triangles is exhibited on this geometry tablet from Babylonian 1700 BC, a 1,000 years before Pythagoras, showing that the geometry that's been found was known, demonstrably known to the ancients. So where this is heading is to reinforce the same principle that Howard Crowhurst has discovered at Karnak, and that is the name of the game is taking solar alignments, constructing Pythagorean triangles, and aligning those to cardinal or, or other major angles to achieve the solar angle at that latitude. Now, if we go back to the beginning when I showed you this triangle of Caribus and Chateau Aguiar, it turns out that a very exact right angle from Aguiar intersects Perpignan Cathedral down here, very exactly. So this is a very exact right-angled triangle, Aguiar, Caribus, Perpignan. Furthermore, when I measured it, I discovered that's 80,000 feet, that's 39,000 feet, that's 89,000 feet, and, and, and not approximately, I mean, very close to accurate here. That is a Pythagorean triangle. 39, 80, 89 is a Pythagorean triangle. Moreover, the large angle of such a Pythagorean triangle is 64 degrees. So look what they've done. They need to achieve 124 degrees as the angle of the winter solstice sunrise. It's been achieved by creating a very exact 60 degree bearing and then laying out a 39, 80, 89 Pythagorean triangle in units of thousands of feet to achieve the 64 degree angle so that 60 plus 64 gives you the 124 degree angle. In other words, it's exactly the same principle as Howard Crowhurst has discovered in Karnak is being exhibited here in the layout of these. Uh... All right, so how did they do it? How did they do these meridians? Certainly it's got something to do with the stars. So I want to take you now to 1350 BC, April the 4th, 10 p.m. I want to take you to Ren Laban and look south. Now, it's a bit difficult to see up here, but this is the star chart looking south. Virgo is up here. Uh, this is Libra, the, the, the usual familiar constellations, except, wait, what's this? That's not a familiar con constellation. Now, I've zoomed in here, and you can't see it, but the red line there is the meridian. This is the constellation of the Southern Cross, or Crux. No longer visible in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, due to the effective precession of the equinoxes. But in 1350 BC, it was visible. And not only visible, but notice this, it crosses the meridian perfectly upright. Now, what do I mean by that? The Southern Cross is like a kite. It rises over here, it stands up, it sets like that. At one particular moment, the top star, Gamma Crux, is exactly above the bottom star, Alpha Crux. Now, that's a very fascinating moment because you can reliably determine that moment every night with a very simple piece of technology, a string and a rock, making a plumb bob and a vertical line. If you set up such a plumb bob and wait and watch the Southern Cross until that moment when it's perfectly upright, at 1350 BC, that meant that direction was exactly due south. The bottom star happens to be two degrees above the horizon here, making this location, 43 degrees north latitude, the perfect location to make use of this unique cosmic opportunity. That the constellation crux so happens to be disposed in the sky at that time as to enable a perfect meridian calibration to be made each night of the six months of the night of the year that it's visible. Now, they saw this coming. Uh, these sides are a bit difficult to see, but this is now 5000 BC. What I'm going to do is show you what happens to the Southern Cross. I'm going to take a snapshot every 500 years. Again, this is the meridian. We're looking south. Here's the Southern Cross, and I wonder if you can see this. As I fast forward 500 years, the Southern Cross is getting closer and closer to the meridian, its upright moment, but it's also falling down until at that point, 1500 BC, it's perfect, and now it starts to fade, and after that, it falls below the horizon. So what's going on here? Well, this is the precession of the equinoxes. This is the position of the South Celestial Pole, the point at which the stars rotate in the Southern Hemisphere. Here's the Southern Cross here, and I've drawn a line from the top to the bottom star down here. So in 12,000 BC, the, the sky is rotating around this point. It slowly starts moving around. 
5,000 BC, it's here. As it's going along this section, it's getting closer to the Southern Cross. So the Southern Cross is falling in the sky, and it's getting closer and closer to this magic position, 1600 BC, where the sky is rotating around that point. Therefore, the Southern Cross is as if you've painted a meridian on the vault of the heavens. And every night you see the meridian. At the moment that meridian is upright, you know that's due south. That's never been possible in any other time to have such an easy, easy, repetitive, accurate way to determine due south. That's why these meridians were made. And you also see that as procession continues, this is where we are right now, in another thousand years, it's going to be the case again. It's going to cross... And so we're going to be able to, in a thousand years, we can all meet up uh, somewhat south of Renaissance, so about, I think it's latitude 27 degrees, and we're going to be able to do the same thing again, use the Southern Cross for high accuracy meridian calibration work. So I'll see you there, anyone who wants to uh, get involved in this work. Right, so I'm by no means the first person to notice the use of crux in, in, in megalithic archaeoastronomy. There's Professor Michael Hoskin has a book, Tombs, Temples and Their Orientation. He shows that the temples in Malta and Gozo were aligned to the Southern Cross, and he, he also discusses these fascinating Taula sanctuaries, which are found in Menorca and Majorca, and they're on the south sides of the island, facing over the sea, and he shows that these are aligned to the Southern Cross as well. Professor Richard North, in his book Stonehenge, 2001, shows that Wayland Smithy Longborough on, on the Ridgeway at Wiltshire is aligned to the Southern Cross. And even here in Glassbury, Nicholas Mann and Philippa Glaston, in their book The Star Temple of Avalon, 2007, talk about the importance of the Southern Cross to Glastonbury and have images of, of crux rising upright over Chalice Hill as viewed from the mound. But I don't think any of them had fully cottoned on to this magical idea of the upright moment of crux enabling this very high accuracy repeatable work. Well, once you start to see uh, the Southern Cross, you start to see it everywhere. This is the, the glyph at Paracas, the famous glyph in Peru, which is carved into a, a, the side of a mountain. And uh, it's, there's a lot of discussion. You can look online. There's a lot of different theories about what this glyph could possibly mean. It consists of a triangle here, a very prominent line like this, and then two lines here. Well, I've added those dots, and uh, they're in the shape of the Southern Cross. Now, you might say that's stretching it a bit, and it would be, except for one, one small fact, and that this glyph points nearly exactly due south. So I've cobbled together this, this image here. This, this is what it looks like in 800 BC when this glyph was, 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 was made. Here you are looking due south. There's the Southern Cross hanging in the sky above the Paracas Monument. So if it wasn't intentional, it certainly worked out that they managed to produce an image of the Southern Cross with the Southern Cross in the sky above them. What about England? What about, what about here? Well. <clears throat> If we go back to 3600 BC, the Southern Cross was still visible from the southern latitudes of, of England, and its upright moment was over here. Now, this is the, the meridian is here. This is 167 degrees. So, in 3600 BC, if you watch the Southern Cross, it would rise over here. It would be go upright here at 167 degrees, cross the meridian, and fall down. Well, that's very interesting. <coughs> Because here is a Google map of, of, of Great Britain, and, and what I've done is I've taken the book uh, Guy Raglan Phillips, Brigantia, a Mysteriography from 1976. This is the book that gave rise to the Bellinus line, of which we've heard uh, megalithomania over the years. Well, in fact, in Guy Raglan Phillips' book, he describes two lines which, which traverse the whole length of the continent and another 20 lines across here. Now, there's no image in his book of this. It's 75. Graphics were pretty, pretty primitive. But he describes in detail these lines. What I've done, I don't think this is, image has ever been produced before, I've gone through and meticulously located each one of the churches that, that he identifies and, and drawn in these lines. Well, they're all very fascinating. They all point in approximately the same direction. There's a little bit of variation of a couple of degrees. They all point to 167 degrees. Now, Guy Raglan Phillips speculates as to why that could be in his book, and he suggests it might have something to do with the magnetic field. Well, I don't think it's the magnetic field. I, I think it's the Southern Cross, because here was the scene in 3600 BC, looking south from all these alignments, the, the two Bellinus lines, the 20 other lines, there's the Southern Cross upright on the horizon, 167 degrees. 
So there must have been some mechanism by which the people who made these lines were able to create the same direction and the simple uh, mechanism of the upright Southern Cross provides a possible answer to that solution. Well, <clears throat> let's loop back now to, to, to where we started. Remember I said that the peak de Canigou was named after the Sar Sirius. Well, why would that be? Well, before we talk about the reason, there's a peak just to the west of it called the Peak de Tres Estel, the peak of the three stars. Well, that's rather fascinating, isn't it? We've got a mountain here named after Sirius, and we've got a mountain named here after the three stars. Well, what, what could those three stars be? Well, here is the scene in 3400 BC. From the peak of Madras, here's Kanigu. Here we are looking along the winter solstice sunrise line. And here is Sirius rising exactly on the winter solstice sunrise line. So let me say that again. In 3400 BC, Sirius was rising along the winter solstice sunrise line. So for those that were here at that time, they observed the absolute miracle of Sirius appearing exactly where the sun appeared on the winter solstice. Now, when Sirius is here, here is Orion, here's Orion's belt, and it's directly above the peak of the three stars. So what we have is the map of the stars literally imprinted in the mountains of the Pyrenees via their names. And even the name of the Pyrenees, Pyrenees, comes from the word for fire, P-Y-R in Greek. So the Pyrenees are literally by the name the Mountains of Fire. Well, why were they called the Mountains of Fire? Well, I suggest they were called the Mountains of Fire because these alignments are done at night. They're done by lighting fires on the peaks so that if you're sailing in from the Mediterranean up towards Perpignan and you look up, you would see the Pyrenees with all these fires on the peaks. No wonder they were called the mountains of fire. Well, it's still true that Sirius was rising on the winter solstice sunrise line for everybody who could see Sirius on the planet at that time. But there was something utterly unique especially at this location. It's not going to give me the slide, but that's okay. It's this. I'm going to say, first of all, the technical term, then I'm going to explain what it means. The true achronical rising of Sirius took place on the winter solstice sunrise uniquely at this latitude at that time. Now, what is the true achronical rising? The true achronical rising of a star is when a star rises at the exact moment that the sun sets. So I have a lovely image to show you here, but it depicts the rising of Sirius, 3400 BC, and it shows Sirius rising on the solstice alignment at the exact moment on the solstice that the sun set. Now, that's never happened anywhere on Earth, any place, any time, for Sirius to rise on the winter solstice at the same place as the sun and at the exact moment of the setting of the sun. No wonder the mountain is named after Sirius. Well, folks, thank you for your patience. That's the end of my talk. My book is The Map and the Manuscript, freely available at the front. Thank you very much for your patience.